that work for, we'll start with polynomials and then we'll go on to rational functions. So let's take a polynomial. Well, we're, what we're doing first. So we're going, looking at limits of polynomials. And rational functions. So what does a polynomial look like? If we do an nth degree, which should be a little n x to the n power plus an minus one x to the n minus one. plus dot 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 plus a1 x to the first plus a0. So this is what a polynomial looks like. And let's find the limit of this polynomial. Now because I just used the letter a all over the place, it's probably a bad move to say x approaches a again, even though that a would not have any subscripts. But that's too many a's. So we'll go with Let's do B. So what limit rule can I use first here? Or I should say what limit law, we call them laws. I think there's only five of them, maybe six. Here they are. Which one should I use first on the polynomial? I'm going to use the sum rule. So you want to think about algebraically, what's the lowest level operation, or what sort of separates the terms. Uh, so we will be using the uh, constant multiple rule and the power rule, but that'll be after we deal with the sums. So we'll sp split the limit up. We're going to write lim, lim, lim a few times here. So let's take these limits now. So what rule can I use? I'm going to go left to right. What rule can I use on the leftmost limit? So there's a power rule, but first I have to deal with, if you break this down, there's really a product before you take a power. So we'll do the product first, constant multiple rule. A n lim x approaches b x to the n plus the same exact thing here, we're going to bring the constant multiple through the limit. That last limit, limit of a0 or a0 as x approaches b, what is that limit? We can just find it right away. So is a0 a constant or a variable? Constant. Our variables are all x. So what is the limit of a constant, this a0? This is one of the two special function limits that we looked at? It's itself. It's always the same value no matter what x is. So this last one is just a0. Constant multiple rule, or a constant uh, function special limit. Now ready to do the power. The power limit law. So 
So we basically bring the exponent outside the limit. So we take the limit of that inside part, so it's just limit of x, and then raise that limit with that limit value to the nth power. And same thing here. And this one, <clears throat> I don't need to use the uh, exponent law at all. What is the limit of x as x approaches b? That's just b. This is the other special uh, limit that we have, the identity limit. This is just b plus a0. Now we have a bunch of lim x's, lim x's. Those are all going to turn into b's. So we have a n b to the nth power, a n minus 1, b to the n minus 1, and how does this relate back to our original polynomial at the top of the screen right up there? It's really similar. I can write it as p of what? b, there we go. So that's just plug in b to your polynomial, that's what you would get. So we had to go through all the limit laws very slowly to show that. So if we combine these together, lim x approaches b of p of x equals p of b when p is a polynomial. So that means you can just plug in the value when you have a polynomial and save all that time that we just went through. So you have a polynomial, you can do that. So let's take a quick notation detour and look at if I used summation notation for polynomial instead of writing it out. So I'll do that in the blue marker over here on the right side. So if we write out our polynomial in sigma notation, so summation just says start k at 0, and then you have a to the 0, x to the 0. The 0 term, this is the k equals 0 term right here. The k equals 1 term is the 1 to the left. And you keep going until you hit n. And this one right here is the k equals n term. And you just add them up as you go. So that's what sigma notation means. So we can apply our limit to this sigma notation and I'm going to use a sum rule in sigma notation this is what the sum rule looks like so in sigma notation basically the sum the sigma and the limit trade places. So when I read it, on the bottom it says, add up the limits of these terms. Whereas on the top it says, take the limit of all these terms, add it together. And that's the difference between the two. Constant multiple rule looks uh, exactly the way you're probably thinking. You're going to take your ak and bring it outside the limit. So it's a k times lim x approaches b x to the k. And then the last thing we have to do is the power, the power law. So we have lim x approaches b of x to the k power. And then finally, we take our one identity limit and we have summation a to the k b to the k power 
And finally, just looking at where we started, this is not p of x, but p of b right there, just in sigma notation. Mm -hmm. So you can save some writing if you go summation notation sometimes. Even though when you start doing it, it feels very weird. Because this operation, going from that equal sign to that equal sign, is where we, no, the other way around. Between those two is where we actually uh, distributed the limit. But it looks really weird when you write it in sigma notation. Uh, it looks like they commute in math terms. They trade places. All right, so we've got polynomials. Let's do rational functions. So we'll go with r of x for a rational function. And r of x, a rational function, is one polynomial divided by another polynomial. So we got px over qx. So that's a rational function. Where p and q are polynomials. And we're going to take a limit, of course. Lim x approaches b r of x equals lim x approaches b px over qx. So it should be pretty obvious what law we want to use in this form. Yes, I do have two polynomials, but at the moment I have a fraction or a division going on. So what law do I use? Quotient. Quotient. We have to be very careful. There is some fine print on the quotient law. So I'll write out the quotient law, and then we'll go scroll up and look at the fine print and see what it says. So this is what the qu quotient law does. It just says take the limit of the numerator and denominator. And good news is p and q are polynomials. So what is the top limit? Limit as x approaches b of p of x. to the top of the screen. If you know you have a polynomial, you can just plug in the limit value, or the x value you're approaching. So we got p of b. And good news is q is a polynomial also. So I can do the same thing with q. So i allowed to just plug in the q right there. We got q of b. And this, of course, is r of b. Now there is some fine print, and the fine print was in the quotient rule. So let's scroll up in the quotient rule and see what's going on, what we need to watch out for. So I'm going to scroll up now, way up to the quotient law, here we go. So it's okay to do this as long as your denominator limit is not zero. So I need to write that in our uh, rational function limit that we just took. So the top line and the second line are equal when lim x approaches b, qx is not 0. So this will be true when our bottom limit is not 0. q is a polynomial. So this is the same as q of b. q is a polynomial, so I can just plug that limit value in. So it's the same thing as saying q of b is not 0. So as long as you're not going to be divided by 0, you can use your quotient rule here. So I'll write underneath. And so if we have a rational function, one way to write it is r of b is defined, meaning you're not divided by 0. Uh, another way to write it, r of b is a number. So if you plug in b, you get a number, then you most likely didn't divide by 0. If you did divide by 0, you get undefined. So 
So this limit law works out, or limit rule works out whenever you're not going to divide by zero. The problem is if you do divide by zero, you have to work a lot harder. You can't just say, oh, it's these two numbers divided by each other. So if you are dividing by zero, you have to work a lot harder. <coughs> So we'll do an easy example and a less easy example. So find this limit. You should be able to find it very quickly. I'll give you 20 seconds. It's a rational function, so use that rational function rule right above it in the box. And here, of course, our b is 2. So any questions on negative 3? So this question is most likely too easy to put on a quiz or midterm. You just plug it in, you're done, no problem. So there'll be a few questions like this in the homework, but these ones are not the ones that are interesting. So I'll give you 20 seconds and see what you can do with this limit. So does our quotient law actually apply here? Sure doesn't. Which zero is the reason it doesn't apply? <laughs> bottom zero. So bottom zero, that zero right there is the reason that I can't just keep going with the uh, uh, plugging in B. So that's not equal to those things. So we can't use that method. Yep. So is the answer zero or the answer? The answer is neither. So we need to do more work. So all we know is I can't use the quotient rule. So what the quantity, it's not even a number, but it is this thing that I wrote down is unrelated to the limit because I can't apply the law that I tried to apply. So all this stuff is basically useless because I wasn't allowed to apply that uh, rational function limit. <coughs> so we have to get a little more clever here. So remember with limit, one of the things I said yesterday was x is close to 1, but x is not 1. So close, but not equal to 1. So let's do some algebra. I like to do my algebra away from my limit, so I don't have to keep writing lim, 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 lim so many times. So I had to write a whole lot just 10 minutes ago. Let's try to reduce the amount of times we write it now. So we'll do our algebra separately, and then we'll uh, use the results back here. So we'll just do algebra and see if we can simplify or change the form of this expression. So we got 0 over 0. If you remember way back to pre-calculus 1 class and, and polynomials, if you get zeros, those correspond to factors. So do you know what factor? So we got when x was 1, we got zeros. So 
So what factor does this correspond to? So, well, this particular factor corresponds to x minus 1 right here. So that should be one of the big, I called the big theorem way back in pre-calculus 1. So if you have a 0 for your polynomial, that is, that corresponds to a factor. And the one it corresponds to is basically make that x value negative. Or, a better way to think about it, if I plug in positive 1, I better get 0 out of my factor. That's another way to think about it. If I plug in positive 1, I'll get 1 minus 1, and that's 0. So I know x minus 1 is a factor. Good news is, x minus 1 is also a factor in the denominator. So I know it's a factor on both places, numerator and denominator. Now, obviously, there's another factor, because they're both quadratic. What is the other factor in the denominator? We have x squared minus 1. It's going to be x plus 1. Those are conjugates right there, or difference of squares. And then hopefully we get another factor that's easy to find in the numerator. Looks like it's 2 or negative 2. So I see a plus here, which means it's going to be a minus 2. Or you can look at the middle term and see that's negative 3 also. All right, so x minus 1, x minus 1 cancels. Now I have to be a little careful with this equal sign. We're missing some information on the right side. On the right side, I have to write down when x is not uh, 1. When x is 1, the left side's undefined, and the right side has a value. Mm. No, when x is negative 1, they're both undefined. So if we think about so that we're actually OK when x is negative 1. Um, they're, they're equal when x is negative 1. Uh, it's a little weird because they'll get both undefined, but they'll, they won't be different. They'll be the same. Uh, but when x is positive 1, you get a nice number on the right side, something like negative a half. And on the left side, you get undefined. However, those two are equal for all the other x values. So all other x values, these two are equal. So good news is, in our limit, does our limit care about x actually equaling 1? Nope. Only x close to 1. So... The fact that it's not equal there, that is not relevant to our limit right here. So we'll rewrite our limit with this nicer form, which is x minus 2x plus 1. And now we have no problem plugging in 1. And our limit is negative 1 half in this case. So you might be able to factor a second time. Or if you keep getting 0 over 0, you should be able to keep factoring and canceling until you get to a point where your one of the two numbers is not 0. And so let's, we'll do a really quick example like that. So I made this example problem intentionally simple, uh, the algebra intentionally simple. So what algebra, what is this reduced to? That 2 is supposed to be a power, not a coefficient. So that's just x minus 1. We got one extra x minus 1 on the top. Now I can plug in 1, we get 1 minus 1, and we get 0 here.
And if I plugged in 1 first, I would have got 0 over 0, which would have been, uh, that's an indication you need to do more algebra at this point. So you could get 0 over 0, but that's not at all related to the actual limit. That's just an indication you need to do more algebra. So we'll do a, another problem. It'll look very similar. What does this reduce to? Should be really easy. One. So limit of one as x approaches one. What is the limit of one as x approaches anything? One is constant. All right, last w one we'll do here. I'm going to make the denominator have more factors than the numerator. So, oh, the intermediate step I'm not showing. You get 0 over 0 on all of these is the reason that I'm starting here. All of these are 0 over 0. And I'm showing you that 0 over 0 can go lots of different ways. So this one, this one is 0 over 0 if you just plug in the x value. So that's not, the quotient rule is not applicable. What reduction, what does this reduce to algebraically? One over x minus one. And now we plug in one, we get one over zero. Now one over zero is very different than zero over zero. We will deal with this, but we'll deal with it in a one or two sections from now. So this will be one of the following, either plus infinity, minus infinity, or um, does not exist. Basically what's happening is a vertical asymptote in the graph. And the only question is, this is a vertical asymptote, and there is three situations. You can either be approaching the vertical asymptote on the top side, on the left and right. That would be positive infinity. Negative infinity would look similar, except you're approaching the bottom on both sides. That would be negative infinity. And does not exist is where one's up and one's down. So they don't agree. And of course, that could go the other way, where one's down and the other one is up. So if they don't agree, you get does not exist. If they do agree, you're either plus infinity or minus infinity, if they're up or down. And we'll do this, I think, in 2.4 or 2.5, somewhere around there. So we'll get to this very soon. So we have one more theorem before we do a few last examples, and the theorem's called the sandwich theorem. So also known as a squeeze theorem. So we'll write down the sandwich theorem. Suppose g is less than or equal to f less than or equal to h. For all x in some open interval, containing x equals a. Except not necessarily at x equals a. So we have this property near a, but not necessarily at a. 
So I like to think of this as the Goldilocks function, where you have cold, medium, hot, and you have sort of small, medium, large y values. And what the sandwich theorem says, you take the limit as x approaches a, the limit of g is less than or equal to the limit of f is less than or equal to the limit of h. So if you know your functions are lined up like this, small, medium, large, your limits go small, medium, large. Oop, that first function should be g. So g is the little one, f's the medium. And h is the big one. So that is the sandwich theorem. Another way to write this out in a more visual way. So you got your little function approaching L, your big function approaching M. So your middle function has to approach something in between L and M. Generally, you're going to pick G and H so that their limits are the same thing. So in practice, uh, G and H are chosen so that that L actually equals M. Thus, your limit. What number is less than or equal to a number and greater than or equal to the same number? So if I wrote this down, what x value would work there? Three. It's only one number that's less than or equal to and greater than or equal to the same number. So if you pick your outer, your small and large function nicely, they will uh, sandwich your limit down to a single value. Now, of course, you can pick functions that have uh, maybe your first limit's negative 100 and your second limit, limit's 10,000. You could say, oh, my limit's somewhere in between those two. But that's not necessarily helpful. So you're going to try to pick functions that uh, have the same limit and they'll squeeze the f function in between. So graphically so you have some nice functions, some big function and some small function but you have this crazy function in between that maybe goes like this right here. But you know it's always between these other two functions. So if this one right here, there's our crazy function. Our top function is the big one, h. And our bottom function it will be the little one, g. And then, of course, that point right there is your a value. So then you can say, oh, the limit has to be squeezed in between those two functions. So most of the theorems that we're going to use are going to take this form, if A, then B. So we call A the hypothesis. And B is the conclusion. Now I want to warn you, hypothesis means something completely different in science class. So hypothesis is something you think is right, and you either demonstrate that in your lab your hypothesis was satisfied by your experiment that you did. So in science, hypothesis is basically an educated guess 
And if enough people have proved it, at some point it turns into something like a law or some other word that they use. Uh, in math, a hypothesis is your conditions that must be true. So in our case, in this theorem, the hypothesis was everything that came before the word then. So here's the word then. So everything that came before that word is your hypothesis. So we need a small function and a big function that had this inequality uh, uh, in an open interval around A. That's all I need to satisfy this hypothesis. So I just need a small function and a big function. And the conclusion is the limits are ordered in this way. So the limit of the small one is less than or equal to the limit that I want, less than or equal to the limit of the big one. So that's our conclusion. So hypothesis are the initial conditions that must be satisfied. And your conclusion is going to be true whenever the hypothesis was satisfied. So if I'm sure A was true, then I know B has, has to be true. So we'll look at a theorem that's not in math. If I get food poisoning, then, oops, if I could spell, then I vomit. All right. So I think we generally agree it's probably a true or a correct theorem. If you get food poisoning, real food poisoning, it's probably going to end in one way. So we'll talk about satisfying the hypothesis. So hypothesis is right there. That's A. Conclusion, I should only write, only underline that last part. That's the conclusion right there. So if you know I got food poisoning, you could be sure of one thing, the conclusion. And tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more about if you don't know A, you actually don't know. This theorem is completely useless. <laughs>